I want to give you an example showing you some different things and I have made a small script to do this. So we have some data here, we'll read it and that what we are asked to do is to predict 50 time steps ahead, what are we expecting to see? So let's read the data, look at what we got. We got x, we got some time, observation times here, and then we have something called time 2. We're not paying too much attention to that, but just continue from here. So let's first, a good thing is always to plot the data. I'm just setting some parameters for the plot. Let me make it a little bit larger. So you can see the plot here before me and uh, behind me. So we have a cloud of observations here, over 500 observation point time, uh, time points. And the first thing to do could be to just do a linear regression. Because it looks like you have some kind of a linear regression part here. So let's just do use LM to do this. And then what I often do is that I is to use a parenthesis around the estimate because then it also prints the result of that. So I get an intercept and a slope relative to the time. If I want to have the p-values and a lot of other statistics, I just do the summary of this model. So I have the standard error of these estimates and I can see from triple star out here that it's highly significant, those two parameters. So at such, we are happy. We get a residual standard error estimate of round one and we are basically just happy. Let's just add a line in the plot here to show what was the slope and the line that we estimated. And as such, it looks quite good. To get an estimate of the variance, we can do that ourselves as well, because this linear model object contains a lot of different parameters, elements down here. You can also look at the summary of it. Here we have the residual standard error mentioned down there. But let's just do it manually for reference. You take the sum of the residual squared and you divide by the number of observations, so the length of that, minus two parameters. And then we get exactly 1.06 as we also had up there, except for rounding. So we can also do this, this is done using the LM function, but if we can also do this in a manual way, so let's create the design matrix one here, I'm not doing the trend model now, I'm just doing the regular where everything is time is relevant, uh, relative to the original point in time. Just showing you the first six rows here. We solve this, we get the same, when we compare, we get the same estimated parameters as we were doing before. So as such, we're just happy. So what we're going to do now is to make the prediction 50 steps ahead of time. So I will, this can be done in many ways. First, I will do it kind of the notorial way, just do it one by one, and later on I'll show you how to do it more efficient. So I'll allocate time, uh, space in memory for those predictions. Then for each of them, I will, what I will do is that I will look at, for the prediction interval, a quantile from the t-distribution with 498 degrees of freedom times the estimated sigma hat, times our prediction expression here. This is f of the time. So this is the time x that corresponds to the time that we're doing the prediction for. The inverse of x transpose x. If I want to make more efficient, I should do this once and for outside the loop, but that's how things are sometimes. But let's just run this loop here. Then we can make a data frame where we just have the predicted here, x hat. It's the intercept plus the slope times the time points where we're making the predictions. Then we do the lower bound for the prediction interval. And we're, going, we're doing a 95% prediction int interval. So that's the predicted value minus the in width of the interval and then plus the interval so what we have here is the predicted value and the lower and upper bound for that. So let's just, we actually have this plot, but let's do the plot again, where we make space for f adding the predictions out here. 
Let's plot the fitted value, that was the red line, from before. And now we add the predictions, and we add the lower and upper bounds of our 95% prediction interval. And when you look at it, well, at least I find that it looks credible. Now what I will do is to just redo the prediction part here more efficiently. We did have the linear model object here. And what you can do is, first you make the time a data frame with the time points where you want to have the predictions made. Then you say that I have the linear model, I want to make a prediction interval, and I want to use this data set for predicting. And this here gives me exactly the same numbers as what I got and presented here. So to plot the same thing in a more efficient way as well, first plotting the points, plotting the fitted values, and then instead of plotting this out here, first one and then the other and then the third one, we can do what is called mat lines to add a matrix of lines out here. What we can also do, this is a prediction interval. We also have the confidence interval, say, how confident are we in the actual estimate of the line. So that's just the same thing as before, except I'm saying prediction, we just say that's a confidence interval. And let's just add that in here. So we're quite certain about this regression line that we have here, given the model structure. And the uncertainty on the predictions is fairly large. Now the question is, are we done with this? And the answer to that question is, no, we're not quite done. Because now we just assume that the model was perfect, everything was appropriate. But what we should do is to test and look at their assumptions for this model. So we should do the validation. Let's first just plot the residuals here. They should have a mean value of zero as a horizontal line. And when we look at this, it doesn't look too bad. You could say that maybe they are too large in the beginning and then they fall a little bit and then, but it, it has, I mean, I've seen much worse plots than this. Let me put it that way. Let's also check the histogram of that. So this is the histogram of the residuals and compare that with the density of the normal distribution. And again, this looks quite nice. I would say, in my view, this plot is nice, but it doesn't provide too much information unless things are very skewed. So it's not a very sensitive measure, but it's nice to look at. We should also test if we can assume things are normally distributed. One such test is the so-called Komlogov smirnov test, where you compare with the density of the normal distribution, say how large a departure is there from that. Then you look at the cumulative density function, and the p-value is 0.7, which means we cannot reject that the residuals are normally distributed. So what it does is basically to look at the empirical cumulative distribution function, and then compare with the p-norm, and then it looks at the difference between those two curves. And I think it's quite easy to see that these two curves are very close to one another. Rather than a histogram, I do like to do a QQ plot if by QQ norm and then QQ line. And you can see there's a small departure down here, but things are generally quite nice. Now, I'll just add one small detail here. So this is the line where I use the slope of the estimated sigma instead of what R does by T default is to use two quantiles here. So the red line is added by using quantiles and the blue line is by using the estimated sigma. So in this case, the difference is very small. The estimated sigma is influenced by these procedures out here in the tail that is a little bit smaller and thereby the slope is a little bit smaller than if you just use the center qu quartiles. But it's a marginal difference. Now, let's look at the, again, the fitted values as predictors for the residuals and the timeline. We do see, in this case, look at this plot before. When we look at the fitted values here, we can see that the structure is maybe a little bit more pronounced. At least when you compress things, uh, it is effectively very similar to what we have down here. 
but it seems like there is some curvature in here. So let's just redo that plot only looking at the first part. So this is the residuals in here, or the prediction, and then we add our fit. And what we looked at was something, when you look at the data, it sounds, looks mostly horizontal, but our fit was having a linear slope. So probably we should have something where the observations here are not just a linear regression model, but let's go back and look at all the data. So if it's not a linear regression model, what else could fit this data? It could be a second order polynomial instead, just assuming that there's no slope down here, and then the slope is increasing when we get further forward in time. If we do it with R, in order to get time square, and not just get the interaction with itself, which it won't create, I have to do the I operator here to give the identity of this. So now we estimate an intercept, a time, uh, that is a slope, and then at the initial time in time, and then we have the curvature out here. What we can also do is to take our previous model that we had here, and then we update it by adding the second order term. It gives us the same thing. But let's look at a summary of this. So what we have here is that the second order term here is highly significant, whereas both the intercept and the slope are not significant at the initial point in time. So first thing before doing much more is to reduce the model. So again, we'll use the update function to take our second order model and remove the least significant part, that's the intercept here. So let's remove that and look at the summary of the so re reduced model. And still, the s slope component here, the coefficient corresponding to time, is not significant. So we remove that as well. And now we again have an estimate, and it's highly significant. And everything seems to be at least, uh, now all the parameters, there's only one left, is significant. And if you look at the numbers, also the received standard error here, the question is, can you actually guess which model was used to simulate the data? Because I can confess that the data was simulated. So this is very close to 1.5, and this is very close to 1, which were the true values. Let's get an estimate made by ourselves of the sigma. The same expression just copied down from before using just a different one. Now let's look at the residuals again before saying too much about it. A histogram and the density curve, again, it looks quite nice. It's not unlikely to have spikes like that. And if we look at the other plots for validating the model, things are quite nice in this setting. So let's do the prediction again for the second order model here using the predict function, plot the data, again making space out here by setting, oh sorry, uh, space out here by having x limit to allow that. Plot the new fit here as a second order polynomial here, starts with no slope, add what we predicted here, again it looks very credible, just like it was before. And now let's just add from the linear regression models the predictions from that one. And now it's very easy to see the difference between the two models, but they also overlap quite a bit, which is quite likely. And let's just add for reference the legend here. So we have a quadratic fit and a linear fit to the model. And well, now it Based on what we've been true, I mean, we should not be in doubt that the quadratic fit is better than the linear fit. So that was what I wanted to show you as an example, and just leave the picture here for a moment. So take care. Bye-bye.